I'm going to start again. Okay, good morning all. Um, so we are uh, having a one week long lecture series, online lecture series on different aspects of ocean modeling. Um, essentially, uh, the idea of this course is to introduce uh, participants on basic elements of uh, ocean modeling. So we may not be going into the uh, you know details of ocean modeling because it's a very short term course. And uh, we will be covering uh, ocean circulation modeling. Then within that, uh, we will be going a little more detail on the uh, modeling of tides and their applications, then biogeochemistry, we will talk on wave modeling, uh, storm surge modeling, tsunami modeling, and then uh, we will have a kind of uh, demo because in this um, online platform, it may not be easy for us to arrange uh, uh, practical sessions. So we will uh, um, give you a demo on an operational um, system. So. That is what we plan as part of this uh, lecture series. So today's lecture is um, basically on the ocean general circulation modeling. Myself, Francis, um, I work as an ocean modeler in, in COIS. We configure ocean modeling systems uh, for the uh, operational uh, purposes, operational ocean forecasting systems. Um, so, um, let us uh, quickly uh, look at what is an ocean model. Basically, today's lecture, it will be what, what will be ocean circulation modeling and what are the different components of this system and how we configure them. So it's a very, um, uh, very much like a bird's eye view of ocean modeling. And for any uh, uh, detailed uh, uh, information, you can directly reach to me. So, uh, ocean model, uh, uh, circulation model in ocean is essentially a um, climate model. So, there is no big uh, difference between the climate models or ocean models what we use. So, um, essentially they represent the large scale ocean atmospheric uh, processes. And that, we know that they are very important for the uh, understanding the climate variability or climate change in different space and time scales. Also, uh, we know that these are important tools for uh, not only for climate studies, but they are very important tools for predicting the ocean, so whether it's a very short term prediction or long term projections like climate projections. We depend on ocean models. There are a couple models. There are standalone models. Uh, what we talk today is mostly on a standalone ocean circulation model. We know that the ocean and atmosphere is in constant touch. They interact uh, in all time and space, the spatial scales. So uh, it is not that easy for us to uh, represent all these scales of interaction into the ocean models because of inherent limitations of the modeling. So first important part of any modeling is to identify the most critical processes that we need to model. So uh, that is the uh, essence of uh, ocean modeling. So uh, when, when you uh, start doing an ocean model, we should be very clear that, okay, this is the process that I'm interested to look at, or this is the pro process that I'm interested to you know, project or forecast. Then what are the essential features to be represented in the model? 
what kind of model we should use, what should be the uh, boundary conditions we should apply to get such processes right. So that is the uh, critical part of ocean modeling, uh, apart from the technical part of that. So um, let us first try to define uh, what is an ocean model. So any general circulation model for that matter is a mathematical representation of uh, processes. Quite often they are represented in the partial differential equation forms. Processes can be physical processes, uh, chemical processes, or biological processes, or whatever it is, the processes that we are interested in. And uh, we know that when it is a climate uh, model, uh, that happens over the Earth's surface. So it has its own inherent problems. It has to be in the you know, uh, coordinate system which is usable, suitable for the Earth uh, system. Then we have to discretize these uh, um, equations into the suitable format, and you know, we uh, solve them numerically using uh, powerful computational facilities. Right now, we have. But most important part of this is that, see, as I said in the previous. Uh, um, slide that we have to identify the most important processes whether those processes are represented very well in these models or whether we have to add some something you know, more to that uh, more to the model uh, equations or we can ignore certain things which are not very important so these uh, um, uh, constitute the assumptions and approximations and then the parameterization so if something can be simplified we can say that okay these are the assumptions so we can ignore certain things these are the approximations and if certain processes are not represented properly due to uh, either the spatial resolution or other uh, problems within the physical uh, equations then we may have to represent their effects explicitly to the model. So this is called the parameterization scheme. So critical part of that is that, okay, we need to describe the circulation in terms of mathematical equations. Then you can put approximations, you can put assumptions, and you can do certain parameterizations, and convert this final set of equations into a numerical uh, equation and solve it by using initial and boundary condition because uh, after all the partial differential equations when we integrate we need the initial and boundary conditions. So in a broad sense we can uh, define climate models or ocean circulation models which is again a similar uh, set using this uh, definition. So uh, uh, if we go into the uh, nitty-gritty of modeling, then what we require, we need to observe, observe the ocean, observe the uh, system, then identify the important physical processes, and then come to the governing equations, apply assumptions, approximations, as I said, we have to do the coordinate transformation when it comes to the rotating frame of reference in a spherical uh, coordinate system. Then if something is missing, add through parameterization, numerically discretize, apply initial condition. The best way of doing it is data simulation, which we will be um, uh, listening uh, to Dr. Arya Paul uh, in the subsequent day. And then we apply boundary conditions. That is another uh, important aspect, when, particularly when we are dealing with the ocean models, where we may have uh, lateral boundaries. Of course, surface boundary is also an important uh, condition we have to put. Then all these things have to be programmed. So once we have the uh, numerical discretized model, then this has to be programmed to you know, 
be solved in a computational uh, high performance computational environment and quite often the system is quite robust so if you try to solve it serially it's going to take enormous time and probably sometimes it may not even work so we may have to put it into a parallel uh, computational environment the computational uh, resources required and its management is an important part of the uh, modeling then uh, okay we need to do certain pre processing of the initial and boundary conditions to be uh, given to the models and then execute the model we get ocean analysis or reanalysis or projections like forecast then again convert back into the desired format which we are looking at which is called the post processing uh, step once we have this post process data then okay diagnose that data that's like any other information in front of you but keep in mind that something came out of a set of equations not observed so you can do a diagnostics of this uh, output and then interpret or produce uh, certain services these are the steps involved in the ocean modeling so coming to the uh, details of ocean models so i am sure that most of you or many of you must be aware of the momentum equations its momentum equations are nothing but uh, derived from the newton's second law of motion so what we say is that for any acceleration you need a force and in the earth atmosphere system even in the ocean what we have as the forcing are generally we can conclude into a pressure gradient force then a coriolis force and then friction frictional force which ranges into uh, differ uh, can be split into different components whether it is the uh, horizontal uh, momentum or the vertical momentum we have this set of equations then when it is over the rotating earth we have a fictitious uh, force which is called the uh, coriolis force that is another set of uh, uh, another important force uh, in this uh, momentum equations uh, i don't want to go into the details of these equations because these are uh, very much known to most of you uh, so when we uh, try to understand ocean so uh, uh, that's what i said in the first uh, um, couple of slides that any modeling requires a keen observation what are we trying to model and many of you must be aware of the general circulation feature for example if you take the currents currents is a general circulation feature and i am talking in terms of global scale you can see that there are um, different current systems in the ocean and many of us are familiar with these current systems we have equatorial currents we have boundary currents which are very intense in the western boundaries uh, coastal currents are there uh, in different places we have atlantic circumpolar current is there then uh, you know there are small scale features within the ocean uh, basins so these uh, currents are basically wind driven uh, currents we know that wind plays an important role in determining the surface currents so one part of ocean circulation we can uh, consider as the uh, you know, currents forced by the wind so okay now we know that currents forced by the wind should be represented in my model so that's one understanding we have and when we go into a particular say for example when you do it in a global scale okay you have plenty of these uh, things but when you go into the details for example if you want to do a modeling of the indian ocean then it's slightly different which i'll come across in the uh, next slide apart from the wind uh, driven circulation the next uh, part of circulation which uh, many of us are uh, familiar is the thermohaline circulation particularly in the global warming scenario we must have come across this uh, term quite often so 
what is thermohaline circulation thermohaline circulation is essentially uh, driven by the density gradient uh, due to the thermostatic effects so if you have a particular uh, distribution of uh, uh, density in the ocean water uh, maybe due to the temperature gradient or the salinity gradient then there is a flow setup and these flows are generally of larger time scales and it can go well very well into the deep because uh, you know cold or saline water can sink into the bottom and then it can be transported back to a region of warm and uh, less saline region so that complete the uh, circulation so this thermohaline circulation is also to be represented so if you are looking at a global scale ocean model okay what essentially we are looking at is to represent the thermohaline circulation right and the wind driven circulation right if you want to get thermohaline circulation right you need to have the right representation of the density gradient of the ocean which involves the right representation of temperature and salinity not only at the surface throughout the ocean uh, depth of the ocean so this part is a very critical uh, component of the ocean circulation model and if you are not very much interested in a climate scale uh, change you are very much um, uh, happy to see what happens when the wind blows over the ocean and okay still you have to get a, a representation of effects of wind right in the uh, model so uh, as it when it comes to a particular basin so this large scale features we have seen uh, may not be sufficient to be described even this is a very simplified uh, form of uh, uh, circulation in the ocean, indian ocean you can see that the indian ocean currents are not uh, uniform uh, in winter and summer because of the effect of uh, monsoons if you go to the tropical um, pacific or tropical atlantic uh, it, more or less we get a steady feature of you know, equatorial uh, circulation uh, forced by the trade winds but when it comes to the indian ocean due to the changes in the circulation atmospheric circulation uh, forced by the monsoon circulation the currents also have changes what you see in the red color is uh, uh, particularly you see that change in the northern hemisphere not much in the southern hemisphere so in the northern hemisphere what you see in red color is uh, uh, what is the kind of circulation you can expect this is a schematic during the monsoon time that means june july august summer monsoon time so what we see is a coastal flow along the somali somali currents then uh, there are uh, you know small scale or not very small scale large scale eddies like uh, uh, great world and socotra jai this is um, uh, there in the indian ocean then we have coastal currents we call them as east india coastal current and west india coastal currents then there is a monsoon current uh, on the top of that but when it comes to the winter what you see in the black uh, color is the winter circulation we have again change in the direction of the currents because the atmospheric force forcing changes so representation of uh, circulation over indian ocean is complicated so as in any other place if you go to atlantic there will be similar features like you know uh, uh, gulf stream has to be represented and the meandering of gulf stream has to be represented These features are there so, uh, whether it is uh, related to the uh, atmospheric forcing or the temperature structure or the salinity structure there are details so if i am uh, not um, very keen on looking at what is happening over the entire indian ocean if i am just worried about what is happening to the eastern part of the east coast of india then the forcings may be little more uh, different or forcing may be same but the response may be different so this has to be represented in the model 
Now, as a uh, basic uh, refresher, I just want to um, remind all of you that, okay, if there is a wind blowing on the ocean surface, then it induces, it transport momentum, uh, transfer momentum to the um, to ocean surface below that. So, it tend to push the water in the direction of the wind, but as you know that since it's in a rotating uh, earth surface, there is a uh, force that deflect the motion. It's called the Coriolis force, which we have seen earlier. So Coriolis force deflects the flow into right hand side in the uh, northern hemisphere. So essentially, the wind, uh, current, surface current, will not flow in the same direction of the wind. It will flow with an angle of about 45 degrees to the wind in the middle latitudes. So uh, then. This is the flow at the surface, but we know that the ocean is uh, fluid, which has some sort of viscosity associated with that. Water has a viscosity. So when the surface uh, layer start moving, it also take uh, the subsurface layers along with that. But due to the friction, there will be a dissipation of energy. So the same amount of energy will not be transferred to the subsurface layer. It will be dissipated to some extent by the uh, viscosity. Nevertheless, it will again impart some momentum to the subsurface layer. So it will start move in a direction of the surface, but again it will get deflected due to the uh, you know Coriolis force. So this uh, uh, makes a spiral kind of a movement with the velocity decreasing with the depth. So we know about this. We are very familiar with the Eggman's um, spiral, Eggman drift. So I just wanted to um, remind all of you about the effect of wind. Essentially, we represent in terms of Eggman uh, drift. And we know that this effect of uh, Eggman drift if, uh, in a normal condition can go as deep as something like uh, 200 or 300 uh, uh, meters below the surface. Sometimes it can go even deeper in the middle latitudes. So that is one uh, part of the ocean circulation forced by the wind. The next one is uh, again it's a refresher of uh, geostrophic currents. So if we have a pressure gradient, pressure gradient can come from the gradient in density or gradient in the surface elevation. So in any case, if you have a gradient in the surface pressure, then that can set up a flow. Again, the water mass will flow from high pressure area to low pressure area. But when it happens, it is influenced by the surface rotation of the earth. And then Coriolis force comes into the picture, it takes a turn, and there will be a balance if it is um, if these are the two important forcing forces, then the balance is called the geostrophic band. That uh, is another um, force that set up the ocean circulation. So these are the two important circulation uh, forces uh, that set up the ocean uh, movement in the ocean. So either it can be due to a pressure gradient or it can be due to the actual application of the wind. Now, uh, okay, what we were talking about is uh, was about the wind forced currents, but we know that the currents are not the only features that we are interested. For example, if we are interested into the, uh, you know, on how the temperature changes with depth or temperature changes with the latitude, this is another important uh, part of the modeling. So, uh, if we start from the beginning, we know that the source of energy in the uh, Earth is Sun. So, the Sun's uh, radiation comes uh, to the Earth, Earth absorbs part of it and then reflects due to albedo, some part of uh, it already goes out of the uh, atmosphere, but whatever absorbed by the uh, land or the earth, uh, it will 
emit with a different uh, you know, wavelength. Generally, the radiation that comes from the sun is in a shorter uh, wavelength and the radiation emitted by the earth is in a longer radiation. So this can be a uh, you know first one dimension model that okay we receive radiation from sun and it just get uh, reflected back whatever is uh, um, part of it is reflected but part of it is uh, absorbed and then re-radiated so we have a you know balance of energy but uh, we know that it's not uh, that simple if this was the case we should have maximum heating at the equator and the temperature should decrease from uh, equator to pole world, either side of the uh, equator but we know that it's not that simple uh, earth has earth first thing is that earth has a tilt on its axis uh, it, of its axis on which it is rotating so that tilt is going to give rise seasons. So certain times we experience the maximum incident radiation at around 23 degrees north and certain times we see it at right at the equator, certain times we see it, uh, you know, 23 degree uh, south. So this is the uh, region where we expect uh, maximum radiation it can come from 23.5 23, uh, degrees south to 23.5 north depending upon the season. So there will be a change in the distribution of energy. Along with that, the tilt of the axis is going to make the seasons uh, in the uh, annual cycle. So with that, at a given point of location may not be receiving same amount of energy throughout the uh, year. So there will be brief time when we get maximum heating at one region. Then this has to be distributed. So it becomes a little more complicated. Still, we assume that the Earth is uh, has a uniform distribution of either land mass or ocean. But that's not the case. We have several features over the uh, Earth system. We have ocean. We have clouds. We have vegetation. We have you know, land mass. So the distribution of uh, heat will not be same. The absorption of heat will not be same at different locations. So this now became a complicated situation. At a given point of time, it's difficult. At a given point of location, it's now becoming a little complicated to tell what could be the radiation we receive and what could be the radiation it affects. For example, even if we consider that that's on the top of um, uh, over ocean, we don't know, okay, this ocean, whether it has a cloud-free condition or cloudy condition, okay, if it is a cloudy condition, then, okay, what sort of cloud it is? So, all uh, kind of interaction comes uh, into the picture when we uh, really try to model the, you know, energy budget of the earth. So, a typical distribution of uh, uh, heat in the uh, Earth system can be explained in this way. We have maximum heating at the equator, then decreases either side, but with season it changes. So, what happens when the, uh, uh, you know, the energy is received at the uh, surface of the ocean? First thing we said is that, okay, part of it will get reflected depending on the angle at which the solar radiation comes. Part of it will be absorbed. And the question is that how far it uh, get absorbed, whether it is absorbed at the surface of the ocean or it goes to the deeper layers. So we need to quantify that. Then, okay, now what happens after that? So the typical distribution of the ocean looks like this. We have, uh, I'm sure that you are familiar with the terminology called mixed layer, thermocline, and deeper layers. Mixed layer is the layer where the ocean properties are more or less uh, same. It's well mixed, homogeneous layer. 
So equatorial region has relatively shallow mixed layer, whereas the uh, middle latitudes have much deeper mixed layers. Uh, we can go into the details of that in a little while. And below the mixed layer, we have a thermocline region where the temperature decreases uh, very fast. And then we have deeper layers where the temperature changes are not very um, you know, uh, critical, or they decrease with, uh, very little. And the, level, the depth of this layer varies with the latitude. Again, this is a schematic, more or less uh, average picture over the globe and speed go from one location to another, it may be different. One basin to another, it may be different. It all depends on how much rainfall you get, how much fresh water you get, how much radiation you get, uh, how far you uh, away from the action of wind. All those things determines the depth of the mixed layer. But nevertheless, this is a uh, kind of uh, average picture of ocean layers. Okay, now we understood, okay, we have action of wind, pressure gradient, both will have consequences on the momentum and then we talked about the radiation. The same way radiation, we can talk about the precipitation because that's a source of uh, fresh water precipitation or uh, uh, melting of sea ice or uh, discharge from the rivers, whether it is due to river um, uh, rainfall or melting of uh, you know, uh, glaciers. But the fresh water that comes to the ocean is a source uh, term. We can consider that as a source term, like what we say that the solar energy is a source term. So we have uh, seen the processes. Now we have to quantify them or put them in a mathematical form formation, formulation. That's what we are trying to do here. So we have a primitive equation that uh, the first two equations we have already seen. Uh, but what is more uh, important uh, to note at this point is that, okay, we have talked about the acceleration term, we have talked about uh, okay, the advection terms or the net rate of change of momentum and then we talked about Coriolis term and we talked about the pressure gradient. Here it is represented as phi which is nothing different than the pressure. You can convert it back and forth. And then we have two more forces. One is the frictional forces and the other one is the diffusion uh, of momentum. So generally horizontal diffusion of momentum is negligible so we just discard it. But uh, friction is not that negligible. That's the basic uh, forcing that drives the ocean circulation. So that uh, we need to keep in the equation. So that comes from the boundary uh, forcing that we apply in the uh, model. Now, when, come, when we come to the second set of equations, okay, this is the tracer equation. So forget about momentum equation. We are coming to the tracer equation. In tracer equation again, the change in the temperature at any given point or salinity in any given point, we can actually say that, okay, there is something which comes from the sources and then we have terms that uh, is called the diffusion. The diffusion of uh, temperature or salinity, particularly in the vert vert uh, vertical direction, is not negligible. Essentially, that is what is uh, keeping the deeper ocean uh, temperature and salinity distribution because the source of uh, temperature or the salinity, uh, so, uh, fresh water, heat and fresh water is at the surface of the ocean. So, this has to be distributed downward. So these two terms are uh, very critical. That's what uh, we will see how they uh, are getting distributed in a ocean modeling point of view in the next uh, part of the lecture. And um, vertical momentum equation is generally approximated as a hydrostatic uh, in hydrostatic balance. So the 
fundamental principle is that the vertical velocity is very small and the vertical acceleration is uh, even small. So, we assume that the pressure gradient in the vertical direction is balanced by the weight of the uh, water column. So, that is how we uh, dis discretize the vertical or uh, reduce the vertical uh, momentum equation into hydrostatic uh, equation. So, this is the approximation. Hydrostatic approximation is an important approximation. But uh, again, we need to think, okay, now we are talking about the ocean circulation on a larger scale. So, well, so a hydrostatic approximation is something which we can do. But that may not be the case when you are talking about a circulation or vertical velocity at a given location. For example, if there is a strong, uh, you know, uh, coastal process, then I, we cannot say that, okay, uh, it's hydrostatic uh, balance is uh, achieved at that location. So, smaller scale uh, processes, maybe coastal processes, it's not uh, that easy to represent everything in terms of hydrostatic approximation. So, you may have to go with a non-hydrostatic approximation in such cases. And uh, we assume that the water is incompressible, so we can say that continuity is achieved uh, as a sum of uh, divergence and the vertical uh, you know, velocity gradient. So, wherever there is a convergence, it, there will be a sinking of water and wherever there is a divergence, there will be an upwelling. So, we can get a vertical velocity from the continuity equation, uh, assuming that the density is uh, more or less constant. So, that's the uh, incompressible uh, uh, condition we are applying. The. Also, we uh, in most of the models, uh, we put a Bosnick approximation that, okay, vertical gra horizontal gradient in the density, we assume to be negligible except uh, when it is multiplied with uh, g. So, this is also a important uh, approximation. But again, for Busnik approximation also we have a uh, problem because Busnik approximation says that there is no vertical uh, horizontal gradient in density. That means the uh, sound waves are filtered out from this solution because sound wave travel with the, as a transverse uh, wave. So, you need vertical uh, horizontal gradient in the density to maintain that uh, propagation of sound. So, whether this is applicable in certain cases, it may not be uh, uh, very accurate to use Busnik approximated uh, models to uh, represent the actual state what you are looking at. So, the reason I put all these uh, um, facts in front of you is that, okay, there is nothing like an ocean model which suits to everyone. You have to pick, you have to choose the right one and you have to see whether certain approximations are valid in the application which you are looking at. Whether you are looking at a specific, uh, uh, you know, coastal application. Say, for example, if you are looking at the you know, specific uh, process that happens just uh, uh, right outside the uh, beach or in the shelf itself, maybe a hydrostatic approximation is not a uh, good uh, way of approximating or simplifying the model. Same way, if you are uh, interested to see, represent the propagation of sound waves in the ocean, then Busnik approximation is going to create a problem. On the other hand, if you are looking at a uh, you know, global general circulation, probably this is a uh, uh, you know, feasible solution. Now, um, a little more details on the vertical distribution because this is where we have to uh, do a lot of you know, add-ons to the model. So, 
from the beginning uh, what we were talking was mostly on the equations which are governing the motion and then we have come across certain you know processes like or the forcing terms that keeps the ocean in movement and the energy balance to some extent now from that energy uh, that we receive at the surface how it is getting distributed in the deep so we need to uh, and whether we are representing such processes in the model explicitly or uh, we have to uh, we are uh, the equations uh, take care of such processes so they are resolved uh, implicitly so this is uh, another part of the uh, modeling so we can say that this is where we start talking about uh, vertical uh, parameterization or mixing parameterization of temp uh, temperature or uh, density or salinity in the ocean this is a mean picture and the vertical axis is given in terms of kilometers so you can see that the surface of the ocean near the surface of the ocean there is a uniform distribution in temperature that we call as the mixed layer and mostly density and uh, salinity is also uh, more or less you know, constant in that layer and there is a sharp uh, uh, change in this uh, properties temperature salinity and hence the density this region we called as a uh, uh, thermocline region and what we see here is after that is more or less uh, uniform temperature or density or salinity that's the deeper ocean how do we get this information of course we all know that there is plenty of ocean observation systems which gives the structure of ocean uh, very detailed and these observations not only give the structure of ocean slide but we also get you know, relevant information to make our ocean models behave like what we see in this uh, picture so that process is called the parameterization so before going into the parameterization so um, what we can do is that we'll take a, a 10 minute break now and then uh, we'll come back in another 10 minutes then we will continue with the mixing process and then the mixing parameterization schemes and then uh, we will talk about the other aspects like uh, what are the grids we need to use what are the coordinate systems available in the ocean models and then a brief picture of a, a operational forecasting system so that will be the next part of the lecture so let us quickly take a break 10 minutes and come back
okay uh, welcome back so uh, we will now start discussing on the uh, mixing processes uh, that distribute the you know, uh, heat and salt to the deeper ocean the reason i want to put a little time on this is uh, because when we do the ocean modeling this is one of the most uh, uncertain part of the modeling and we need to understand it clearly uh, before converting into you know, uh, the specified parameterization scheme so um, see this is a beautiful picture uh, which uh, kind of uh, summarizes the major processes mixing processes happening in the ocean so if you look at uh, uh, that there are two part of the uh, parts uh, in this one one is uh, wind another one is the solar radiation so when in the previous um, uh, part when we discussed the importance of wind we said okay wind is giving momentum to the ocean and then it starts pushing the waters to move whether that's all uh, wind is doing no wind is doing much more than that so that's what uh, we are trying to understand in this part so um, again we saw in the previous uh, section that the solar radiation is an important um, source of energy so assume that the water surface receives the ocean surface receives heat energy from the sun the first part of the uh, um, process is that okay but a certain part is uh, reflected back for forget about that whatever received at the ocean surface then the surface will re radiate in uh, uh, longer radiation but it's not that whatever ocean received is uh, uh, re radiated back a part is going to go down to heat up the ocean not only the surface it go to the uh, interior of the ocean also to certain extent so when we want to uh, distribute energy within the ocean we should know how deep we have to put this energy down short wave radiation down and uh, when we again talk about the surface layers whether all energy uh, even if we say that the mixed layer whether all the energy that received from the sun is spent uh, for heating the mixed layer that is also not true a certain part goes even down and we call it as penetrative uh, radiation so whatever radiation solar uh, solar radiation short wave radiation that is received at the surface of the ocean will go down and then it heats up the mixed layer and a certain part um, is transmitted further down also that part we call it as penetrative radiation when we do a uh, heat budget analysis we have to account for that energy that is going uh, below the mixer layer because that's not available for heating the mixer uh, layer so if you uh, if you come across a mixer layer heat budget then you have to subtract that uh, you know uh, energy what is going below the mixer layer anyway that's one part of it so uh, this is going to heat up the ocean surface and then another process is the wind okay what happens uh, to the ocean surface with wind of course we get a movement of ocean surface in the direction of the wind and then we get deflection because of the coriolis parameter in any case Uh, what we found is that the surface currents are not uh, subsurface currents are not flowing at the same speed of the surface currents because of the viscosity so if you have a uh, gradient in the velocity uh, with vertical whether it is vertical or uh, horizontal you are going to get a turning effect it's the curve so in this case you are going to get a turning overturning and that overturning is uh, going to increase the mix so one effect of wind is uh, giving momentum starting the flow but at the same time once the flow is uh, started 
it can introduce mixing. So one, one way of mixing heat energy what is received at the surface is through this shear. Okay, shear in the currents, horizontal current. Then another important uh, part of the wind is that once the wind is uh, uh, applied over the surface of the ocean, the second uh, uh, important or maybe what, the, what we see much more prominent is the waves, generation of wind waves. And wind waves are also going to uh, be responsible for mixing. And this uh, process is called uh, Langmuir circulation. So along the direction of the wind, you can start seeing the uh, you know, uh, circulation cells. We call them as Langmuir circulation. And Langmuir circulation is also kind of a mechanism that brings the subsurface water up and surface water down. So if you are uh, uh, referring to the effect of wind uh, or wind driven waves on the mixing, the critical uh, point to describe is the Langmuir circulation. And this comes essentially because of the wind applied on the ocean surface, introduces a wave, and then it, in turn, it produces a stock drift. And this stock drift is going to uh, be responsible for this Langmuir circulation. This we call it as wave current interaction. So that's going to affect the thermohaline structure of the ocean. So again, that's very important. And of course, the wave breaking and um, you know bubbles and all those things are action of wind. Again, that uh, disturbs the cool skin of the ocean, and then uh, uh, you know small scale mixing takes place uh, in the ocean near the ocean surface. So these are the important processes by which the ocean sur uh, energy that is received at the surface is getting mixed. And at the same time, when we come to the deeper ocean. What we see is that the effect of wind is not there, but the effect of wind at the surface can trigger uh, internal waves, the waves uh, which propagate in any direction, and it can even propagate in the deeper uh, ocean. And that internal waves are going to again create a shear in the uh, currents, horizontal current. And that internal waves, whether it is produced by the winds or it can be produced by even tides, I'm sure that tomorrow's lecture you will come across on how these tides are generating internal uh, waves or internal tides. They also uh, mix the interior ocean. A large amount of or almost uh, entire uh, mixing process in the interior ocean takes place of this internal wave uh, uh, processes. So uh, to summarize, we need to represent processes one is the wind driven process and we said okay wind driven process includes the shear in the circulation i mean the currents but the horizontal current vertical shear in the horizontal currents Langmuir circulation wave breaking okay now another problem with the uh, uh, heating at the surface or say if we get fresh water at the ocean surface from precipitation or something a river discharge then there will be a um, change in the density of the water. Assume that for some reason, say due to a precipitation or evaporation, excessive evaporation, assume that if due to excessive evaporation, the surface water become more salty, saltier water is heavier water, so it's going to sink. And this, uh, once the water sinks, this place is going to be occupied by a little more fresher water. So this is going to create a uh, you know, uh, circulation or this process we call the physical movement of the water uh, takes place. That, that process is called the convection. And there are differences in the convection uh, or the diffusion due to uh, convective processes. It can be either due to the change in the density or change in the um, salinity. It can be changed due to the change in the temperature distribution. So uh, there are uh, further details on how this uh, diffusion takes place. But this is an important process by which the energy get distributed within the ocean. So uh, just to summarize that uh, we have wind stress applied on the surface of the ocean and 
we know that the surface portion is generally warmer and the subsurface is generally colder but once we set up the uh, wind is it's going to affect the circulation it's going to increase the uh, vertical shear and this is going to produce a mixing and subsurface surface water becomes little colder because of the influx of the subcold subsurface water whereas the subsurface water become a little more warmer because the surface warm waters are coming down this process takes place and the other problem which we talked about is due to the buoyancy that means if the denser water the surface become denser it start sinks that's going to basically it's a buoyancy uh, driven process so these two uh, process processes are in general uh, is going to determine the mixing process in the ocean now um, just to um, give a brief on the processes one we saw that the vertical shear of the horizontal flow other one is the you know buoyancy term we know about this brand uh, voice shallow frequency and representation so essentially is a function of density gradient in the vertical and these the ratio between these two terms uh, we we know very well that this is called the richardson number gradient richardson number and this is an important uh, concept in the uh, ocean modeling particularly because when it when you come in the model what we have described in the initial steps is that okay ultimately the equations have to be discretized and then solved using numerical equations so then you have to represent you have to tell the uh, you know computer okay up to what depth uh, you need to consider this uh, vertical shear is important or up to what depth it is important the buoyancy driven processes are important so this has to be explicitly mentioned so this uh, uh, take uh, you know in certain mixing schemes this Uh, comes with this gradient richardson number there's a concept called gradient richards number that i explained and there is another concept called bulk richardson number it's nothing but it's it, this process it's not the local gradient that is uh, uh, considered it's the gradient from the surface of the ocean so that we call as a non local uh, you know, gradient or bulk richardson number and when it comes to uh, Uh, the ocean mixing uh, as i said this plays an important role so based on this uh, you know richardson number uh, the ocean uh, models have uh, come up with or ocean modelers have come up with the mixing scheme why we have to do this because as i said in the uh, one of the previous slide that the term uh, which i have shown in this uh, red circle is um, a critical parameter and this these are called the diffusion parameters and the time scale and length scale at which these processes takes place are uh, very much very and most of the time what happens is that irrespective of the time scale or length scale what we define for the model this may not be represented very well in the uh, ocean ocean model so this has to be explicitly given and more a large fraction of the problem comes from this part uh, in the ocean models uncertainty comes from the representation of mixing processes in the ocean and same way if you go to the uh, momentum equation a large amount of error uh, in the ocean model also come from the friction terms or the amount of or the momentum that we are giving so surface forcing that we give if you don't have the right surface forcing this is going to create problem so uh, essentially the wind and other parameters which we give to the ocean model as an input can significantly affect the quality of the simulations same way the way we tell the model to mix this uh, you know whether it is um, uh, tracer uh, values tracer uh, parameters are also very much determinant in 
defining the structure of the ocean. And if you don't get the structure of the ocean right, then we have everything wrong. So uh, an important uh, uh, mixing scheme, uh, there are uh, different mixing schemes uh, uh, devised for ocean models. I am only uh, discussing the KPP mixing scheme, which are uh, used in most of the uh, ocean models. Uh, there are other mixing schemes, Mellarema, the uh, mixing scheme and other uh, uh, mixing schemes. But in this one, I'm going to discuss mostly on the uh, KPP uh, mixing scheme. So this is a closure scheme based on bulk Richardson number. Since it is based on the bulk Richardson number, it's a non-local uh, mixing scheme. That it, the effect of the processes happening in the surface also is considered when we close the uh, turbulent in the interior ocean as well. So it's a, essentially a non-local uh, uh, mixing scheme. So what it is uh, doing, it's a very, how the mixing is, uh, you know, represented in this ocean models. Uh, mostly ocean models, they use this KPPs, particularly climate models. So that's why I'm using this as a example. So what it does is that, okay, we get surface fluxes from the uh, atmosphere, momentum, mass, uh, buoyancy, radiation, whatever it is, we get from the surface of the, uh, at the surface we get from the atmosphere, surface fluxes. And then part of it definitely goes down, as we said, the penetrative shortwave radiation. And there is a very thin layer uh, where the uh, processes are slightly different. It's in the molecular uh, length scale, but there is a larger uh, uh, depth where the D processes are more you know, dominating. So we consider the thickness at which these uh, boundary processes are very important. is called the depth of uh, uh, surface boundary layer, or we call it as HSBL. And this depth, in this depth, we can see that the Richardson number, but we have seen that buoyancy and uh, uh, shear processes are dominating. So we have buoyancy driven uh, mixing, we have uh, uh, mixing due to the shear process. Up to this depth, we have a balance between these two. So we have to consider both the processes are really different. In this one, the KPP mixing scheme uses mainly the diffusion in the interior ocean, mainly due to the vertical shear, uh, horizontal, uh, vertical shear in the horizontal flow. As I said, it can come from the internal waves. This is what the basic concept of the uh, mixing scheme, uh, what we talk about KPP mixing scheme. So a little more details are given here. So as I said, there is a surface boundary layer, HSPL, and this is uh, uh, considered using the uh, bulk Richardson number. The height of the ocean boundary layer, or HSBL, is defined as the smallest depth where the bulk Richardson number is equal to a certain value of critical Richardson number. Basically, this indicates that the boundary layer, at least, should be able to penetrate to the depth of H before they become stable with uh, respect to the local buoyancy. So this is the concept applied in the surface boundary layer. So um, as we discussed, there are, we consider uh, KPP mixing scheme considered the surface layer as a distinct layer and the interior ocean as another distinct layer. So we have two set of equations and this has to be matched. And this is done using a shape function which is uh, given in this uh, uh, cubic polynomial uh, distribution. So uh, it's a very uh, elementary explanation of how KPP uh, scheme is defined. So nothing uh, very um, important I have given. I have uh, uh, explained mainly that the surface layers, the shear and buoyancy plays and a, a role and the interior ocean it's basically shear that drives the mixing and since these are represented in two diff distinct uh, regimes 
we have to have a continuity on this uh, mixing process so that is done using a shape function this is what it is done in the kpp uh, mixing scheme so uh, these are the details of uh, how the interior ocean it is uh, uh, done as i said it's basically the uh, uh, shear driven mixing interior ocean mixing is basically due to the shear and that shear comes from the internal waves. So I, I will skip these details in this lecture. So now we have uh, uh, understood the equations a little bit better. We understood that, okay, there is a momentum equation and then we have a tracer equation. There is a lot of uh, difficulty in, uh, you know, representing the diffusion uh, term in the, uh, either in the temperature or salinity in the, uh, equation so we don't get it you know implicitly resolved in the equation so we are trying to put it in an explicit way that's called the physical parameterization we have come across a parameterization scheme called kpp scheme there are other schemes also for example Meller ramada scheme is completely based on a local um, you know, gradient in the uh, uh, shape and density. Now uh, we we have come across these seven equations. Now we have to discretize them. So, as I said, the equations, partial differential equations, have to be numerically solved. For that, you have to put them into different cells. So we can assume that the globe is split into you know, small sets of our desired size. There is a lot of uh, implications on the size of the grid you are taking because certain processes, if you want to represent, it requires a certain size of the grid. So if the grid cell is something like 100 kilometer by 100 kilometer in horizontal, then you may be able to represent large scale features, right? But many small scale features, mesoscale eddies, may not be uh, represented well in such uh, uh, models. So if your interest is a global model, global general circulation, okay, a low resolution is fine. And you are interested not on you know, uh, very small scale processes, you are interested in the climate scale processes, then a large, uh, you know, coarse resolution is okay. But if you are interested in certain process that happens right at the cost of your interest, then this is not sufficient. Probably these are influenced by the local, uh, you know, small scale features, mesoscale eddies, or even sub mesoscale uh, level eddies. Then you should choose the scale of the grid, uh, you know, the way you want it. So selection of the model grid is a very, very important part of uh, ocean modeling. So choose the right model based on the physics of uh, your interest. If you are interested in certain things, fine. This is good. Uh, it also depends on where you are, which latitude you are, whether you are at the equator, okay, certain uh, resolution is fine, but if you are away from the equator, then certain uh, resolution uh, is required because as you go away from the equator, the length scales of motions will come down. So you have to be very careful in choosing them. Then we have to put it into the layers. So uh, I have given three uh, common coordinate systems as i said not only the horizontal we have to put this is a circulation model we have vertical uh, uh, dimension to the ocean so we have to put our equations in the vertical dimension as well how do we do that we can simply divide the ocean into different layers say i am going to divide the ocean into 100 layers of certain depth say 50 meter or something like that then fine but the problem with this is that the first layer is uh, zero and then the next layer is at 50 meter. Most of your processes, surface processes will get over in this one layer itself. And there is no way you can represent all these processes in that single layer because everything will look uniform. You may not have a proper mixer layer. So what you can do is that you can reduce the thickness of the layers in the surface you can increase it in the interior ocean where you are not very uh, keen to uh, look at. 
So that way you can change the distribution of the depth the way you want it. The advantage is that it's very easy to uh, uh, you know uh, code because we, we know what is the depth of a uh, particular cell at given latitude and longitude. The number of layers are also fixed and it's a very simple thing. But only problem is that when it comes to a complex bathymetry then we are going to get into trouble. Certain uh, you know bathymetric features may may not be well represented in a particular uh, grid. So we are going to get into trouble, especially when you are looking in a coastal application where bathymetry plays an important role. Uh, this is a very pro popular um, um, uh, coordinate system, particularly in the climate model where you are not very keen on what happens in the uh, right to the coast, but you are more interested in the general circulation features. But when it comes to a uh, one way to overcome uh, this is to increase the number of uh, you know, vertical grids. So instead of 100, you add to 200 grids, uh, vertical levels. It can you know, reduce the errors. But practically, we have to see we are going to solve this uh, equations at 200 levels, but per, per, and plus uh, different uh, you know grid cells as we discussed in the previous section, uh, horizontal uh, cells. So it's going to be very, uh, you know, computationally expensive exercise, and whether we are going to get the right or desired outcome, uh, we don't know. With this, uh, there will be improvements, but it will be at the cost of your computational efficiency and computational resources. Whether there is another better way of representing it. So there is another uh, method called Sigma coordinate system, which is basically a terrain following system. So it simply, if your vertical uh, uh, levels follow, simply follow the uh, you know bathymetry features, contours. So it's not, um, you cannot represent it uh, like my thickness is three meter or 10 meter or 50 meter. It all depends on where you are, what is the depth of the ocean, and also to some extent, the tide because the surface of the ocean is also not 